They say, the harder the work, the greater the reward. This is our life's work. Good afternoon, or almost good evening. It's 527, <laughs> Tuesday, September 20th. I'm all thrown off by the date and the time. This is the TDN Writers Room, presented by Keeneland. My name is Joe Bianca. I'm the associate editor of the Thoroughbred Daily News. And what do you have to say about my Jets this week, Bill? <laughs> Go Jets! How about the, but here's what I have to say. They're not as good as the Giants, right? 2-0. and oh. How about that? But, Joe, look, I'm actually, since I don't care that much about football and I don't like the Patriots, I'll live vicariously through you. Go gang green. Thank you. <laughs> and I'm Randy Moss with NBC Sports along with Lucy. It's hard to tell, but that is a dog behind me on the couch coming to you <laughs> from Minnesota where the Kirk Cousins for Governor signs have now come down. <laughs> Listen, as long as you keep them out of prime time, he's, he's your guy. Problem is all those playoff games, those are going to be on national TV too. The TDN Writers Room is brought to you by Keeneland. If you haven't noticed, the Keeneland September sale is going on right now. It's been record-breaking. It's been million-dollar horse after million-dollar horse. They already surpassed the gross from 2021 yesterday with several days still to come. It runs through this Saturday, September 24th. So there's still in time to get involved. Lots of good horses still up for bidding. So go get involved at Keeneland. This weekend was the big weekend, the big Saturday at Woodbine, where they had three grade one races, which were all Breeders' Cup winning your in races, the Woodbine Mile and the Talma and the Summer Stakes. And I'm getting deja vu, guys, because we had this conversation last year when Charlie Appleby came through and swept all of those races. He didn't quite sweep this year. He got two out of the four. He got the, the, the uh, Woodbine Mile with Modern Games, and he also had the Summer with Mysterious Night. Modern Games ran the best race of any turf horse in America this year. I don't think that's up for debate. He got 112 buyer. He ran in the best race of his career. His European farm form did not suggest that that kind of performance was coming, but he was devastating in that race. And I got to think he's going to be a pretty heavy favorite now in the Breeders' Cup mile. Uh, the two-year-old looked pretty good for him as well. Also one off. And also Charlie Appleby won the uh, Jockey Club Derby at Belmont at Aqueduct, Belmont at the Big A, BAQ with Nation's Pride, who's also a very nice three-year-old. What would you guys think of the Charlie Appleby freight train this weekend? Yeah, I mean, Appleby was the story, but we're not surprised that he was the story. Matter of fact, we would have been surprised if he didn't come in and devastate everything. Just uh, some of these statistics are unbelievable. At Woodbine in his career, he's settled, run nine horses. Seven of them have won. All seven are grade one winners. Shows up in not, with nine horses, comes away with seven grade one winners. Overall, uh, the last two years, he's 14 for 28. That's 50%. In his career, running in North America, 19 for 43 with 44%. And not only that, you, you nailed it with, you know, with modern games, who claimed to fame was that he was the winner of the messed up race where he was scratched at the gate and wasn't scratched and then wasn't scratched and then wasn't scratched and everybody was mad about it. But, you know, if you, other than flight line, who is the biggest lock of Breeders' Cup Saturday? You would have to say right now it is modern games. And I agree with you. I tried to beat him in that race, even despite the Applebee mystique. I just thought his form in Europe this year was okay. I know he ran second last time out to Baid who was you know, the best turf horse in the world. But, you know, he was well beaten. He hadn't shown a – he hadn't really, to me, run back to his Breeders' Cup performance or hasn't been consistently running back to it. He comes into the Breeders' Cup mile now as the absolute horse to beat by a mile over um, – you know, I don't – you know, I, I think, you know, who else is going to come from Europe? We don't really know. But I can't even at this point think of anybody in the U.S. that would even be able to warm this horse up. And, you know, what Appleby is doing is amazing because, you know, it's one thing to see guys win 40%, 35%. 50%. This guy's doing it with grade one races and grade one horses only. He's not winning the fourth race at Saratoga on a Thursday, which is a maiden 25 non-winners of three lifetime. Um, just absolutely amazing statistics for a guy who, you know, when he comes here, doesn't always bring his first string horses, but boy, he knows where to place them. And he knows absolutely the right horses to bring in. So um, can't wait to see modern games come back in the Woodbine Mile. Uh, mysterious night wins the summer stakes that horse will obviously be the favorite in the grade one breeders cup juvenile turf and then you know nation's pride wins the jockey club derby he's probably the least of the three only because he's been winning against three-year-olds and is going to have to face older horses when he gets into the breeders cup but right now i wouldn't I wouldn't count any Applebee horse out uh, under any circumstances. Just an amazing story what this guy has done over the last couple of years. 
Oh, the Appleby juggernaut is is just unbelievable. I love the race call at Woodmine, right? As mm. modern games is coming to the wire, the, the race caller says, and this time you can cash your ticket. I thought that was a nice, yeah. thought that was a nice touch. Uh, the 112 buyer speed figure was the highest figure so far for any turf horse in America. Just happens to be that I make the Woodbine buyer speed figures, and I can tell you that it was an absolute slam dunk. There was no doubt at all. It was an easy speed figure to make. And what one of the things that is interesting to me is that, yeah, he was beaten by Baid in his most recent start, the Sussex at Goodwood in late July. He was beaten a length and three quarters, but that was Baid's least impressive race mm-hmm. so far this year. It was his lowest time form figure. He got a 128 time form figure. It's his only start this year out of his four races, which he's run lower than a 130. So he really wasn't the the best Baid that we've seen. So, I mean, my gosh, to think that modern games could not be able to beat that Baid and come over here and dominate our horses the way he did. Uh, it just really makes you look forward to seeing what this horse can do going forward. Uh, as far as the other American horses out there, I mean, there's only one so far that's run a number that's anywhere close to that. Count, again, was very impressive in the Shoemaker Mile at Santa Anita in late May. Uh, he ran a 108 buyer speed figure in that one. So, so far, he would be about the only one numbers-wise that could even be in the in the modern game's ballpark. Uh, I looked at the early betting. Uh, it's hard, kind of hard to find a Breeders' Cup Juvenile Turf anti-post odds, but Mysterious Knight is, as you would expect, the favorite uh, right now over mostly Aiden O'Brien trained horses over there. Nation's Pride, I didn't think he beat much in there. Uh, it was a short field. Todd Pletcher chose to back Annapolis down from a mile and three sixteenths to the Saranac at a mile and one sixteenth instead of going up at a mile and a half uh, to take on Nation's Pride there. So it was pretty much a cakewalk. He is not the favorite right now in the early betting, uh, the betting lines for the Breeders' Cup turf. That would be a horse called Luxembourg, who is uh, trained by Aiden O'Brien. He's one of those cool more horses. That's five for six lifetime and coming off a win in the Irish champion stakes. But that doesn't even count Yabir, who's had a little bit of a minor setback, the defending champ in the turf, and hopefully he can make it back. So it looks like the Europeans, not just Applebee's, but others are uh, are pretty well set right now looking ahead to the Breeders' Cup. Hey, Randy, I'm curious, where do you find these odds? Because I, I look around a lot and, and I am I, I can't necessarily, I can find Breeders' Cup classic anti-post odds, but but some of these, you know, sort of second, more more not so high profile Breeders' Cup races, where is this information available? It's some of the sites, unfortunately, lock you out over here in the United oh. States. But Odds Checker, okay, Odds I'll have Checker to is that. a is a uh, is a very nice resource to look at what they refer to as anti post betting mm-hmm. uh, for mm-hmm. the Breeders Cup and some other big races. Okay, good. Yeah, that's, that's what I use too. You can also use that for. Uh, I've seen Odds Checker for presidential elections as well. Oh, every yeah. Odds. On presidential candidates, yes, yeah, so I was checking that a lot during the uh, the wee hours of November fourth, twenty twenty. But yeah, it's, it, that's that's definitely a good resource. Uh, you know, the thing that that Modern Games performance as great as it was made me think. It made me have a little bit of longing to see Baid in these states. Like I want to see him come and run the Breeders' Cup Mile. He's obviously not going to do that. That's that to me is the, the kind of leftover feeling from how good Modern Games was. That if he's that good. What would Baid do if he came here and ran the Breeders' Cup mile? But obviously, we're not going to get to see that. But I wanted to mention a couple other races before we wrap up. We had the uh, the two-year-old races. These are the first two-turn graded stakes for two-year-olds this year on dirt uh, in America with the Iroquois and the Pocahontas at Churchill Downs. And it was the story of, you know, I think there's a story with these races a lot. that people go crazy for these horses who have these one big figure at Saratoga and they crush them down to odds on. Like I remember it happened with Stellar Tap, who was that horse who got Steve Asmussen's record breaking win. And that horse was like fourth or fifth at odds on this year. It was echo again in the Iroquois was three to five made an early move into somewhat fast pace, but really just had nothing in the stretch and and curly Jack won at 10 to one over a 54 to one shot in that race. And then the Pocahontas, the I, the even money favorite was Grand Love, who was another impressive debut winner at Saratoga. But she got cooked a little bit on the pace and lost to Fun and Feisty. It wasn't a huge price; it was six to one, but came from way back to win for Ken McPeak 
and uh, and Julian Leperu. So she's a little bit of an interesting horse, especially stretching out. Um, but, you know, I just kind of just the lesson of those races over the years is that people just go nuts for these one race horses, one race two year olds. And then they, they end up more often than not disappointing, especially when they're stretching out to two turns for the first time. I thought that that, that was noteworthy and something to remember for those races in the future. Uh, we had the closing weekend at, at uh, Kentucky Downs. Nothing really jumped out that much in, in, over there. Uh, but also wanted to shout out the sponsors, the Green Group, Lennon John Green, who had at Monmouth in a $500,000 two-year-old race, the Now 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 Stakes, Web Slinger, Constitution Sun, won for uh, Mark Cassie and Dylan Davis. I can't believe that race is $500,000. That's a coup right there because that's, you know, it's a restricted non-graded two-year-old race. I guess they had to do that a little bit to compete with the Kentucky Downs races, but you compare it to the rest of the Monmouth purse structure and those stakes races, it really sticks out like a sore thumb, but shout out to Len and everybody at the Green Group and DJ Staples for that win. So it was a nice weekend of racing. We're going to spin it forward. We got Pennsylvania Derby weekend this coming up, Pennsylvania Derby and the Cotillion this Saturday. We're going to get to that later on in our weekend preview. And after this break, we're going to talk to Randy, the uh, the chief complainer about the times and the, the issues with timing races in America. Rightfully so. Rightfully so, the chief complainer. We're going to talk to him about that after this break. TDN Writers Room is brought to you by Keeneland. We talked to Tony Lacey a little bit earlier. It's obviously been a banner sale for Keeneland. You can, you know, you can expect more great results the rest of the week, but even just so far, they've already beaten the 2021 gross, as I mentioned earlier. Some stats through book three. The average is $264,000, 10.67% higher than at this point in the sale last year. Median of $200,000 is 11.11% higher than in 2021. And on Monday, a candy ride colt sold for $600,000. And the average was just under $100,000. Still lots of good value to be found now in book four and through the rest of the sale. As I said, it goes through Saturday, September 24th. Still time to get involved. You can check out the rest of the catalog at theworldsyearlingsale.com. We'll be right back after this message from Keeneland. When the thoroughbred world descends upon Lexington this November, there is one place you need to be. The place where history comes alive with every championship victory. He's off the dick and deep. The place where the future is built with the fall of a gavel. The place that exists to be the heart of this industry. The center of it all. Home to the November breeding stock sale and the 2022 Breeders' Cup, Keeneland. Spitestown. Bunning. Echo Town. It's Echo Town for Joe Talamo and Echo Town. Race the way. And Echo Town is drawing away in the stretch. Echo Town wins the Allen Turkin Stakes. A sire line so prolific it repeats itself. Echo Town. TDN Writers Room was brought to you by Coolmore. Justify had two winners on Saturday. How lovely it was Justify's first fall. Broke her maiden at Pimlico and then Gandolfini, named after, of course, the great late actor James Gandolfini, won on debut by five lengths at Los Alamitos. Shouldn't say that. I don't know for a fact that's named after Tony Soprano, but I'm guessing. Justify is now the sire of 14 winners, led by four stakes winners, which I believe is the most among two-year-olds this year. I think he has the most two-year-old stakes winners. Practical Joke had a maiden special weight trifecta at Monmouth on Saturday when Sheeta Booty, I'm going to be careful saying that one, won by six and a half lengths over Spouty's Girl and three carrots, all three sired by Practical Joke. Second crop sire, Practical Joke is the sire of 62 winners in 2022, including three stakes winners. Coolmore sires are making headlines in the sales rings, as sales ring as well at Keeneland September. Justify has had $2 million yearlings so far. Fellow Triple Crown winner, American Pharaoh, had two yearlings, sell for over $700,000. And Uncle Mo, always plugging along at the top of these lists, has had five yearlings sell for over half a million, led by a pair of $600,000 Colts. All right, tease this before the break. This has to drive Randy Moss crazy because he is a figure maker, as he mentioned before. We've talked to him about it before when he was a guest on the show. Now he's a co-host, and the problem has gotten even worse over that time where we cannot seem to pr- 
properly time races in America. You know, Bill brings this up a lot. The Saratoga Derby, which still does not have a speed figure, as far as I know. Still, Joe, it doesn't have a time. The time have, does not it's, exist. It it's, have it's, time. There's no time. Yes. Yeah, I know. And it's not the yeah. only race. Like if you, especially in New York, if you look at a lot of the past performances, you'll see hand timed a lot. Randy, why is this problem getting worse and not better? Well, it, in some cases, it's getting better, but it, there's a lot to unpack here, and, and I'll do it quickly. The, the Saratoga Derby, for example, um, the New York Racing Association has requested that Equibase not publish a time unless it is endorsed and accepted by Naira. So it is not Equibase. It is Naira that is dragging its feet and not okaying uh, what the video timing people have come up with, which is an accurate time for the Saratoga Derby. And in the case of buyer speed figures, because of the way our system, it's being changed. But right now, according to the way our system is, we can't do a buyer speed figure for a race that has no published final time. So that has been that has been very, uh, very, very frustrating. As far as the epidemic of, uh, of hand timing, there are a couple of things at play here. Uh, first of all, the beam system that is in effect at most racetracks in America is fairly low maintenance. It doesn't require a whole lot every year to keep it going, but occasionally it does need some new parts and it needs some tweaking here and there. And during COVID, some of those parts, because of the supply chain problems that COVID created, were very difficult to get from China and elsewhere. And so there was a parts shortage that if you go online, uh, you'll find out that it has begun to uh, alleviate itself a little bit. Uh, but there were some racetracks that did not were not able to secure some of the parts that they wanted. Also, because of COVID, there has been a labor crisis in America. And those beam timing systems require skilled operators. And I know Naira was having some problems at one point uh, last summer and last fall at Saratoga and then after that at Belmont Park with some timing as it related to the operator of the American teletimer system. You have to know when to activate the beams, uh, exactly how to do it. And it, it, there is some skill involved and there were some mistakes made that led to, uh, that led to some bad times. The other issue right now in thoroughbred racing that we've talked about a lot is the, is the G max issue. Okay. The GPS timing of races. Um, what Equibase has done a very good job of is these racetracks that converted to the G-Max GPS timing that turned out to be a disaster because the timing was so inaccurate. Equibase has come up with portable wireless beams to use for the final times at those racetracks such as Del Mar and Woodbine, some of the major racetracks that switched to G-Max. So, the final times for those races are now accurate, but unfortunately, the fractional times are not. Uh, for example, last year in the Breeders' Cup, the Breeders' Cup Classic and that supersonic-paced Breeders' Cup Distaff, fractions were wrong. The Distaff was a fast pace, but not nearly as fast as the published times made it to be. The Pacific Classic this year with Flightline, the fractional times were wrong. Earlier, the shared belief stakes that day, the fractional times were wrong. So tracks out there that have a working beam system that's providing accurate fractional and final times do not succumb to the sales <laughs> pitch or the temptation to change to GMAX because you'll still have your accurate final times. But the way it stands right now, your fractional times will be considerably less accurate. Randy, it was interesting. You you listed the and if, I'm not criticizing you because nobody has been more outspoken about this than you have. But you gave a litany of excuses that I'm sure you've heard from people in the industry about why this isn't they're not doing a better job. The excuses are inexcusable. Right. It's 2022 and we're doing a poorer job of timing races than we did in 1952. How is that possible? The sport wants to be treated as a major league sport, as a mainstream sport. And then you have things like this. Could you imagine an Olympic event? Usain Bolt goes out and runs whatever distance he's running, wins a gold medal. And then afterwards, someone says, but what was the time of the race? 
And the Olympic Committee says, well, we don't really know. We'll, we'll get back to you. Uh, I mean, that would make them a laughing stock and, and the subject of so much ridicule. You know, I don't know what the answers are, but it's not my job to come up with the answers. This is inexcusable. And it does seem that the problem is getting worse. You can't pick up a racing form and go through a card where you don't see 15 races in the past performances where it says hand time. I mean, somebody needs to get their you know what together here and fix this. You know, the betters depend on these times, even, you know, the, the, the breeding industry, the racing industry, everybody depends on accurate times. And it's in 2022, we haven't figured out how to time races. It, it, it just, it, it's astounding to me that this problem persists. And, you know, in print, you and I, I wrote and you talked and we beat up on GMAX pretty good. And apparently it deserved it. But when I see stuff like the Saratoga Derby example, that's not GMAX's fault. Naira is Saratoga is not a GMAX track. And I see plenty of races from other tracks that are not GMAX tracks. It just makes me scratch my head that how can horse racing not get this right? And again, I know you don't have the answer, but I just find it completely inexcusable. And, you know, I'm tired of, of is it the supply chain? Is it this or that? Oh, maybe. But damn it, I don't care. Let's get this right. I think you're absolutely right. 100 percent right. You're 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 preaching to the choir here. Uh, some of those problems, for example, Equibase, when it went over to England and purchased this GMAX timing system, right? I mean, it thought it was revolutionizing the way horse races are timed in the United States. It it said, and and it was accurate, that races were being timed in the U.S. in 2020, the same as they were being timed in 1937, that it was archaic, that it was antiquated. We're going to bring in this fancy GPS system. Well, a couple of years went by, come to find out that it was a very inaccurate GPS system, that technology for, for technology's sake is not a good idea. At the same time, Equibase bought American Teletimer, which was the single most common you know, purveyor of the beam system at racetracks all around the country, like Churchill Downs and Naira and elsewhere. And they went around and told racetracks that they were shutting down the beam system in America. They were going to put the beam system out of business because they thought they had something better. Now, lo and behold, they don't have something better. So it's upon Equibase to get what we know works right now, the beam timing thing, completely done properly and to, and to solve some of these problems. And the second big part of the problem, Bill, is that there are racetrack managers in charge of these things all throughout the United States who, A, don't understand the problem, and B, don't appreciate necessarily mm -hmm. the importance of the final times. And unfortunately, some of them are at the New York Racing Association right now, which is why we don't have time for the Saratoga Derby published. Yeah, I'm curious what you do as a figure maker in these cases. Are you, are you or your buyer team timing these races yourselves? Oh, yeah. I mean, we know yeah. that Nation's Pride got a 93 buyer speed figure to win the Saratoga Derby. We just can't put it in the system. It can't be published. Writer's Room exclusive, 93 buyer speed <laughs> figure for Nation's Pride. You know, I wondered also if, you know, we have this ridiculous run-up system in America where every race, every, every track, every race has a different run-up distance. Does that complicate things at all? Doesn't help. You know, yeah. it is it is it is very antiquated, uh, yeah. and they don't do that anywhere else in the world. So right. it's something that a lot of people have have called to change in the United States. It would make the running times a whole heck of a lot slower. So right. I'm not sure that every horse player and every racetrack manager uh, necessarily advocates that, but it would make for more consistent timing of races from track to track, definitely. Gotcha. We'll keep fighting the good fight on that, Randy. I mean, it's just, it's insane that, that we have, we still have these problems and that it's not a bigger stink and it's not everybody in, in the higher ups of racing doing everything they can to fix this. It's that's still persisting like this. But I want to shift gears a little bit because we talked to you about this two weeks ago when you were on the show. We talked about Flightline, obviously, whether or not he was going to come back as a five year old. You said before we talked to Costa Hironis that he, they had a, he had about 1% chance of coming back as a five-year-old. Then after you heard what Costa Hironis said on this show, you bumped it up to about 4 or 5%. And then, of course, last week, the stud deal was announced that Flightline, at the, at the conclusion of his racing career, is going to go stand at Lane's End. Let's put a little uh, – can we put a, like, a little meter up at the bottom of the screen with Randy's head on it? How, what percentage chance are we at now 
on the Randy right. Moss meter to see flight line in 2023. Yeah, Joe, I, I kind of pride myself on being an optimistic glass half full kind of guy. And I was very pessimistic a couple of weeks ago about the chances of flight line running. And rightfully so. I mean, we've been beaten over the head for the last quarter century with the reality of stallion revenue versus racing revenue and seeing all these top class resources get an early retirement, which has not been good for the sport as a whole, I think, in most of our opinions. So there was good reason for me to be pessimistic. But I also said that I had no inside information on that. I was just operating on my opinion based on what we had seen in the past. Well, I proved that I had no inside information because I was wrong. All right. I've since come to learn that it's not just Costa Hronas, who is the majority owner of Flightline, by the way, who would like to see the horse continue to run. There are others within that ownership group who feel the same way that Costa does. So the chances of Flightline running as a five-year-old are higher, certainly, than what I thought a couple of weeks ago, even though the economics of running him next year would be totally out of whack, right? American Farrell retired for a $200,000 stud fee. Justify retired for a $150,000 stud fee. Flightline is a faster horse than either of those two, and he has a tremendous pedigree. Even if he stood for the modest $150,000 sum, you're looking at a at revenue of at least $30 million in his first year at stud, which is far more than he could win if everything went perfectly on the race track. Now, having said that about the owners, it's certainly not a slam dunk that he's going to come back and run next year. Um, when that money starts to percolate a little bit, right, it can change some minds. And also, if he were to win the Breeders' Cup Classic impressively, if he were to dominate the Breeders' Cup Classic, what more would he have to prove? Uh, yeah. So I, you know, I, but definitely the odds of him running next year are higher than, um, than my pessimistic one to 5% estimate a couple of weeks ago. Right. Hey, Randy, since you seem to have some insights into this and maybe, you know, some more insider knowledge that, you know, maybe Joe and I don't have one thing that I love Costa Ronas, the interview was tremendous, but when I asked him, how is the process going to be decided who votes, what kind of percentage they have. He dodged the question. Do you have an understanding of that? I mean, I still have no idea how the five different ownership groups, do they he have an equal say at the table? Does one, because Costa Rodas make the decision on himself since he owns more than everybody else? Do you have any insights into that? Because that was one thing, that, that was one of the best interviews we've ever done, pat oh, ourselves yeah. on the back here. But great. that was the one question that was went unanswered. Well, what I've been led to believe is that the voting share basically if you call it a voting share in this decision uh, would be commiserate with the percentage of ownership in the race. Okay. So okay. let's say if, if Costa owns 30% of the horse and someone else owns 25% and they both want to run the horse uh, next year as a five year old, then their right. two shares would supersede all the others. But right. again, as we talked about with Costa, I mean, this is a pretty close knit group of owners and one of the owners happens to be Bill Farish, who is standing the horse at stud at Lane's Inn. Now, what I've been told is that Bill is much more amenable to running the horse as a five-year-old than you would expect from a guy that makes his living off of standing stallions, right? Uh, so it's going to be interesting to see exactly how mm -hmm. this uh, how this mm -hmm. works going forward. You heard it here first. Randy Moss personally guarantees that Flightline will come back and run a full campaign. <laughs> 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 no, I mean, because I, I, I want to say full campaign because I said before in 2023, because he could technically run in the Pegasus and then retire to stud next year. So, yeah, I mean, it's I, I do think that these guys, these these are, you know, steeped in racing guys who understand the benefit to the racing public and to the, the racing fan base of having a horse like him race for a little bit longer, race more than five or six times in his career. And I, I do think that in. In the end, I think they're more likely than not to do the thing that's beneficial for the racing public, at least for a little bit. Joe, I, so. I want to bring up another point, though. And, and you're right. You know, doing what's right for racing is obviously bringing them back. But it, look, you know, I've never walked a mile in these people's shoes or anywhere close to it. But they could wait 100 lifetimes and they would never get a horse like this again. And 
How about just the pleasure and enjoyment? Look, they're going to make so much money off breeding this horse for many, even if he retires after he's five, he's going to stand at stud for 15, 16, 17 years, maybe something. They'll make so much money. Their great, great grandchildren will never have to worry about, you, you know, making another penny the rest of their lives. I do sense, particularly from talking to Costa, that they understand that, that you live and dream of getting a horse like this. 99.9% .9 of the people that play this game are never going to have a horse like this. So let's, that thrill that we get, can we replace that by making a lot of money? It's a totally different thing. And I think that that, that is, I think, and I hope and think that is is entering into their thoughts as well. And it seems at least from talking to Costa Ronas, at least that has definitely entered into his thoughts. I hope it does too. I, mean, I do. But, yeah. if it, you know, when you look at the bottom line, I think let, let's say let's say Flightline wins the Breeders' Cup Classic by a nice modest eight lengths, okay, as opposed to the nineteen in the in the in the Pacific Classic. Okay, now at that point, let's talk about the what does he have left to prove angle. All right, what we saw with Arrowgate was a horse that no other horse in the world had any chance of beating on the dirt. Until mm -hmm. all of a sudden, inexplicably, for no apparent reason, he wasn't the most unbeatable horse on dirt. And his form took a, a, a nosedive to where he was well beaten in the Breeders' Cup Classic in what I believe, what I recall, is the final race of his career. Uh, so there is a risk for continuing to run a horse, perhaps, when you look at the risk-reward ratio. Maybe the reward wouldn't be there because he's already won the Breeders, Breeders' Cup Classic in dominating fashion. What more could he do at that point to prove to people the kind of horse that he is? But hopefully, I think three of us hope that the fun aspect of it, the enjoyment of having a horse like that will overrule the hard and fast economic part of it. Right. Well, like Bill was saying, and like I've said before, like this is what it's all for. This is why you spend all that money. This is why you put in the hard work to get to the top of the game in racing is to get a horse like this. This is better than a derby winner. You know, everybody says, oh, everybody wants to win the derby. This is better because there's a derby winner every year. There is not a flight line every year. There's a flight line once every 30, 40, 50 years. This is what it's all for. It's only downhill from here. No matter how many great horses you guys have going forward, they are not going to match this horse. And the, the public wants to see him. And, you know, I kind of think a little bit about Jess Jackson and Curlin. Because remember when Curlin won, you know, he had a great three-year-old, four-year-old campaign, came back as a five-year-old. They ran him on turf. That was the kind of sporting thing where it was like, this is the most popular horse in the world. He's sound. People love to see him. He's great. We want to share his greatness. That's what I think about people like that who take their horses and know that they belong to the public, you know, at least sentimentally as much as they belong to you. But I, like I said, I, I believe in these guys, and I, I do think that they're, they're going to end up doing the right thing. By the, and, by of the course, player. the way he campaigned Rachel Alexander, perfect, great example, but Jess Jackson. So. And, of course, Absolutely. all this, all this is predicated on him coming out of the Breeders' Cup Classic in absolute 100% physical condition, which, yes. which falls in the lap of John Sadler right there to make that determination. The TDN Writers Room is brought to you by the Pennsylvania Horse Breeders Association. We are looking forward to Pennsylvania Derby Day this weekend at Parks. We're going to talk about it in a little bit. Uh, it's going to feature 11, an 11-horse 11 field, including Zandon, Cyberknife, We the People, Taba is also the grade one cotillion, with a field of nine that features Secret Oath and three other graded stakes on the card. They'll also have the final leg of their two-year-old PA sired, PA bred stallion series with the $200,000 Prince Lucky Stakes at six and a half furlongs and the $200,000 imply stakes at the same distance for Phillies. Next year, the series is going to be expanded to six stakes for over a million dollars in purses and awards. So now is the time to look for your PA sired, PA bred horse and not to be forgotten. Chub Wagon runs this weekend. Can't wait to see her. Hopefully she'll bounce back from her last race. I know she will actually. We'll be right back after this message from the PHBA. Here in Pennsylvania, we're proud of our breeding program, the best in North America, but we're also proud to be leaders in this industry. The PA Horse Breeders Association is funding cutting edge research at Penn Vet to detect gene doping in thoroughbreds. And we endorsed the SAFE Act to help protect the most vulnerable horses. Plus, we're pleased to support the aftercare programs set up by our horsemen's groups. Just a few of the reasons why you should join us in Pennsylvania, the premier place to breed and race.
TDN Writers Room is brought to you by XBTV. This week's XBTV Workout of the Week is Slow Down Andy, who worked four furlongs in 49 and 1 in Santa Anita on Sunday, which you can see on your screen right now. The Doug O'Neill trainee won the Grade 2 Caesars Sportsbook Del Mar Derby last out in his grass debut on Labor Day weekend. You know, Doug O'Neill is always going to take a shot. So that horse, you expect to see that horse coming up in the Breeders' Cup, I would think. And definitely kind of a late developing horse for Redham Racing. Nice horse and a you know a little sneaky contender maybe for the Breeders' Cup at Keeneland. Mentioned earlier in the, in the show how great of a sale it's been already for Keeneland. They've already exceeded the gross from 2021. They have $13 million yearlings in, the, in book one. It's been an unbelievable sale. You know, pretty much records falling. And obviously, Keeneland has great records throughout the years, but... This is as close as you're going to get. It's a golden era for racing and for sales. And we talked to Tony Lacey, who is the VP of sales at Keeneland, about everything that's gone on so far, the future of Keeneland, and just what it's like to run a sale with over 4,000 yearlings that go through the ring. So check out our talk with Tony Lacey. The Green Group Guest of the Week is sponsored by The Green Group, an accounting, tax, consulting, and advisory firm specializing in the thoroughbred industry. With over 500 clients in the horse business, they have proven strategies to save you taxes. Learn more about how they can help you at www.greenco.com. So we are thrilled to bring her on this week in the middle of a very busy two weeks for Keeneland. Keeneland's Vice President of Sales, Tony Lacey. Thanks for coming on. Thanks, Joe. Appreciate it. Glad to be on. Great to, great to talk to you. Obviously, it's been a, a banner sale. You know, I think we expected the sale to, to go well with how the yearling market has developed over the over this season. But just tell us, based on your expectations going in and what you've seen so far, how they compare. I think you'd have to be cautiously optimistic. You know, we see seeing the figures of the other sales during the year. They were up. They were healthy. The demand for horses right now is really good. I think the industry's in a great spot as we uh, as we sort of chart of the waters through this this i think it's a little bit of a golden era to be quite frank i think there's a lot of enthusiasm i think coming out of of uh, covid a lot of people are really appreciating having fun getting f- together with friends enjoying being at a social event like racing uh can provide and i think it's uh, and i think that's where you see the advent of and the and the uh this expansion of the of the syndicates and uh, partnerships it's really, really been healthy, and I think that that creates its own synergistic effects as people just want to be a part of that. And we've seen it around the grounds a lot this week. Tony, thanks for joining us. And you're trying to answer the question everybody's trying to answer is, what's going on? Why are the sales through the roof? And it's not just the Keeneland September sale, but the sales sure. everywhere. And I had one uh, theory. Um, I can't remember a stallion roster at least in the last 10 years, 15 years, like we have now, Into Mischief, Gunrunner, Uncle Mo, Quality Road, Tap It, Justify, American Feral, and I'm sure I've forgotten five or six other just tremendous stallions. I mean, from you have a top 10 list of stallions right now that I think might match up well with any top 10 list from any time in the history of this sport. You know, your comment on that and how is that affecting the sales? I agree. You know, and that's, uh, as we looked at, at the sale coming together, you know, it's difficult to split horses up. You know, it's, there's some larger books and that's, you know, that's evident in, in many of the numbers that are, uh, you know, in each, in each sale, but it is incredible depth and the strength. And I think these young sires are giving us a, an enthusiasm for the future because, you know, always worry when you got that transition of, of, from, you know, whether you got, you know, the Curlins and, and you know, the Tappets, Warfront, you know, who's going to take over those mantles? And I think we've seen that they're coming at a, in a, at a, a resurgence of, of talent that I don't think we've seen for a while. And it's across the board. And I think it's give, given some diversification in bloodlines that is really healthy. Um, it allows people to, you know, you can, you can get a good, you, I think the only hole in the, ga- in, in the market right now, I think we need a really top class turf horse to prop up some of these, real high class turf mares that are coming through because of the purchases in Europe coming back. And we've got a lot of good stakes fillies in the, in the country. I think it would be really helpful to have a, a couple of nice turf European style stallions to, to sort of balance it out. Outside of that, I think it's incredible. Well, Tony, I'm curious about how a couple of the macro trends out there in the sport uh, might be impacting your sale and others. You touched on one of them. First, the purse money that has just gone stratospheric at some tracks, $100,000 made in special weight races, for example. 
And then also you touched on the rise of the so-called super partnership, where you have individuals that might have been willing to go it alone in the past for expensive yearlings that are now banding together in partnerships of two, three, four, five. How might those trends be affecting chemo? I think it's great because we're we're walking around, like, and I'm just using this small example of Micropoli, Vinny Viola, West Point, um, the Woodford, Thur- Woodford uh, Racing Club, uh, all these different entities that are Donegal. You know, they've they've won major races this year. You know, the, with Nest, Don Mo Donegal, Flight Line. This just gives every everybody an appetite, and every all of those syndicates have more money this year than they've had in the past, as well as many others. So this is. It's affordable now for somebody to get in at a, at a whether it's a, a, a micro share or a more significant way of participating. But everybody feel has ownership in those horses. And again, I was we were sitting beside, uh, you know, Aaron Wellman and his team, as well as just across the box for the Alabama. And that was that was incredible just to be in the middle of that and watch them enjoy and share it. I think, you know, a lot of people probably are starting to find that, you know, enjoying something with a small group of people is is great, but enjoying success like that as a larger group has probably got its own sort of has its own benefits that are beyond, you know, measure. So I think there is, we see a lot of new people walking around the grounds this week. I think the purse money is really validating and making it feasible to own horses right now, you know, with the rising cost. But now it's, if you win one race a year, in, in many jurisdictions, you've paid your bills for the year and in many cases paid for the horse, a part of the horse. So and, and I had an, uh, uh, an incredible amount of enjoyment in, 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 in doing it. So I think it's I think it's really, really a cool time to be in it. Well, you mentioned it's, it's kind of a golden era right now. I think a lot of that has to do with how many super talented horses we have on the racetrack and none more exciting than Flightline. And I think Flightline is an interesting case because He's kind of the proof of concept right now that you can spend seven figures on a horse and still make it big and still make a gigantic profit and have so much fun racing that kind of horse. You know, we talked about it a little bit on the show last week. I don't remember a horse by himself that had that kind of effect potentially on the market and the appetite for horses. What do you think? How do you, how do you think that he's affected the the, the market at, uh, at Keeneland? We all, I think... You know, a horse like Flight Line just gives you, gives the professionals, hardened professionals, chills. I think that's something that we all, sometimes we become a little numb to winners or just having, you know, regular success. But when you see that, we all celebrate as an industry. We celebrate, it rises the industry as one tide. And that gets everybody excited. Um, I, I think, you know, every, we've got comparisons to, you know, Go Sapper to Secretari- Secretariat. You know, and that's, I speak to some of the ownership um, at the sales here. That is something that you can still, their feet have not hit the ground yet. And it shouldn't. If if those, if no matter, money cannot buy you that success, that feeling. And when you get that that uplift from something like that, that lasts, lasts a lifetime. And, you know, I, I, I see a lot of business people who, you know, they're looking at spread- spreadsheets, making a lot of money in their businesses. And it probably is not as exciting as as, as uh, putting their name onto the back, onto the ownership line of a horse like that. So it, it's, uh, and I, I, you know, we all dream of it. It's the dream that we all keep living and it's possible. And that's what, that's what drives everybody forward. And a lot of that money comes right back into the industry. And it's a very, it's a very productive uh, economy because we churn a lot. Anything that comes back into anything made in our industry, we plow it right back in. So it's it's. Um, I, I just feel that we've got to not take this time as uh, for uh, for granted. Look at ways of how we can capture what's working. And again, not all of it is something. It's a not all purse money because I've talked to the auctioneers here who are do many other auctions around the country. It's in standard bread. It's in raining horses and everything. So we we are getting a, an effect that's global. It's the same in Europe, whether it's jumping horses or whatever. Everything is in the equine industry right now is very healthy. But we've got to find ways of capturing and maintaining a certain uplift that's uh, that we're enjoying right now. And I think we can I think we can do that for the most part. 
Tony, we're ending the portion of the sale now. We're not going to see any more seven-figure horses. It's going to be more modest, the middle market, et cetera. I think about the only thing that isn't going great guns for the sales is that those kind of horses are maybe not doing it quite as well as everyone would hope. What are your expectations for the rest of the sales? And, you know, that's, it's a problem that's been going, well, I don't know if maybe a problem is too strong a word, but it's an issue that has been ongoing for many years. What can be done to turn around that end of the market as well? Well, at the moment, I think we're up 25% this year over last year. Um, you know, we've we've been doing multiples on the medians every year. So I think it's what you're seeing is actually a good return for many of the breeders. It's, it's, a, it's a risky endeavor. I'm not going to, but it's a risky endeavor on the front end as well. But there is a lot of happy people walking around the grounds right now. And again, I think we it's, if we, I always use the analogy of a, a, from from a production end, I think breeders are, We've. I always use the analogy of being a farmer. The, if there's a if there's a if there's value for their crop, they're more inclined to expand their operation to develop that operation. And right now, there's a real incentive to do that. Um, you know, it's return return on your investment is not guaranteed in this game by any stretch of the imagination. It isn't a risky endeavor, but it certainly is is looking more fruitful now than it has ever been. And I think we're in a place where. I think demand is outstripping supply. So yes, the second week, a lot of people may look at that and frown on it, but there is some nice horses back here. You get graded stakes winners all through the books. Um, I, obviously, it reduces your you know your 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 risk and your probability of success is greater up front by by a large portion. But there is so many good racehorses through this middle of the books. And that's what, uh, when we were play, putting the books together, it was really difficult to split up. What was a book three, four, five? We're, we're very, it's, it's, a, it's a broad-based quality group now that people are not breeding lower-end horses like might have happened in the past. It's just not viable. And I think that's upstanding. I think that we're getting, gaining the rewards in the ring right now. So I know horse players, Tony, like to uh, like to look at the sales sometimes to get a sort of an early line on what some of the first year stallions that they can watch for the next year. So this will be 2023, two year old maiden races. What are some of the young stallions that are really making an impact right now? Well, there's there's quite a few. I think you've, the one that st stood out to me personally is probably Omaha Beach. I think the first he was a he his stock are very progressive looking. They look very very straightforward and quick looking, very balanced. Vino Rosso is another one that I think has been uh, just very consistent. Matoli, you go, you, I, I, it's very difficult to go to Audible as another one that's really starting to pop up right now that, you know, you could, we saw a notable change in those yearlings as we, as through the summer, because they were, they were horses that were going to furnish when we, we anticipated they would, and they did. So there's, the, I think, you know, the ones that I've mentioned, and there's probably two or three others that I might have overlooked a little bit, but there, there's some really, really quality first season sires right now that I think that it's it's very encouraging. I think last year we had City of Light that everybody got very excited about and we're a little down on for the first part. It was never meant to have early two-year-olds. So I think we need to give these horses a chance and uh, allow them to to flourish, and I think that's one thing in the market can be a little overreactionary to to sort of early results when some of these horses are not meant to have early stock. So I think I would not be surprised to see Omaha Beach come out of the out of the gates early next year and have some really nice nice horses. So it's it's again it's it's a deep it's a deep bench, um, and I think you're you're finding that uh, the breeders are very very particular about what stallions they breed to. And it's, I think they're, they're, they're getting rewarded by following some of these first ones, first season sires. You know, people see the numbers at Keno in September is selling over 4,100 yearlings. And I think they, they understand that it's a massive undertaking to get all those horses through the ring, to house those horses, get all of them sold, all the private sales that are going on afterwards. But can you take us behind the curtain a little bit and talk about the prep work that has to be done to get to Keeneland September and to get all those yearlings there and to do the scouting, to split things up into book one, book two, book three. Like you said, it's difficult sometimes. Can you talk about what your team has to do before the sale to get you guys ready to put those horses through the ring? Well, firstly, it's a team. It's a team effort and it's a massive team that are really incredible people. I'm honored to work with them. 
uh, because we've been tar- working on this tirelessly for most of the year. And it's, you know, this, as people see the horses walking through the ring, we have a story almost behind every yearling, you know, where we've gone to their farms to spoke about each individual. But early in the year, we're speaking to breeders, what they what their opinions are about how the previous year went. And when the entries are flowing in towards the end of April, the first of right at they just coming up to the Derby. Once the Derby is over, we're consolidate all the entries. We l- locate where every group is, each farm, where we need to go to. And we get two, two, sometimes three teams constant on the road five days a week. And we get through almost 3,000 yearlings in about a seven week period in inspections, grading them, looking at them and, and trying to predict, you know, where, where they'll be by September. Where, what's the progression rate? Because we're seeing them one point in time at that stage. And we're trying to predict what their development uh, curve will be. Also, their marketability, who the market is, because you can you can have a horse that's worth X amount, but if it's not in front of the marketplace that is going to buy that horse, you might you're probably going to miss the mark. So it's a very delicate balance. We go through and we have the inspections, we get all our data, all the all the pedigree, all the research that we can get, and then we basically lock ourselves in a room for about two and a half, three weeks, working through each and every one of them. Uh, trying to make sure that we create balance through the books because we have we're, we've got a responsibility to the seller who has entrusted us with that yearling, but also to the buyer that the buyer is affording us their time out of their busy schedules to come and spend time with us. So we want to make sure that the, the 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 horses that they would expect, the quality that they expect, will be on those days, and it's. Sometimes we have to be the bad person because we have to tell people that something is not as good or might be, they might fight and think, oh, I don't, there was a, the book one was always the boogeyman previously, but I think we've, we were adamant that we needed to get the quality forward, that our, we were, we were working hard to get the principals back to the table, let them come, let's an event, get those good horses up front and let's not hide them in the middle of the books. And we were really lobbying for those and it, we did for the most part, and it worked. And that was something that the buyers were very appreciative. The sellers understood what we were trying to do. And I think as we go forward, we want to make sure that we've got something that's incredibly special here. You know, none of us are in, in it for the money. We are passionate about what we do. We're passionate about building the industry. And we're not about the bottom line. We're about doing the right thing and, and growing the industry because that's what Keeneland was founded on. So as we as we do everything we do, we don't ask what is what is what is the bottom what's the profit margin for us. We always ask what is the right thing to do, and that's what we try to do with every single horse, every single consigner, breeder, you know, buyer, trying to make sure everybody feels included and is represented right to the very end because. If I sound tired, that's because I'm exhausted. (laughs) It is a tiring, but you have to be on the ball. If something goes wrong, you've got to be there. You've got to be supportive because we've all been in their shoes. We know what it's like to go up with a yearling and how important that is in the back ring or in the pavilion. As your knees are knocking, you're trying to get that hurt. That makes and breaks your year. So we feel the pressure. We feel the responsibility. Uh, so everybody in this building is is working, working many, many hours a day, making sure that this is as good as it possibly can be for the best result and also for the buyer. So we it, it's incredibly motivating. And uh, so it's I hope they get to do this for a number of years more. But uh, it's it's uh, it's it's incredibly exciting. We're going back. Yes, it's a it's a year long event uh, to putting this together. And uh, it's very exciting to see the results as they come through. Uh, Tony, over recent years, you've tried a bunch of different formats so far as uh, how many days of the sale book one would be night sale versus day sale. Considering that, you know, the sale is going so well, have you now, are you done with the tinkering? Is this, have you found the sweet spot and is this the kind of format that we'll expect to see going forward? Well, but when I came in here a year and a half ago, it was, that was the thing. We all, we were, we were, I was a consigner. So it was one thing we wanted. One thing we all do as horse people is want consistency where people are, we're creatures of routine of, so when we show up on a certain day, we want to know what we're doing. 
it's like in the barn in the morning at the farm and the, the horses enjoy it, but we understand that's what creates a consistency. The, again, everybody was a little intimidated about having something up front in the books, but it was counterintuitive to what, what the marketplace was looking for. We were, we were encouraging people to come here and working hard, traveling around the world, getting people to come to our sale and some of the better quality were, were being placed, you know, and it was, it was, it's a really, really difficult thing to do. So as we were adamant that we have to get this right. And that's where the, this format works well for lo logistically. It works well for the buyer. It works well for the seller. And obviously it worked well for the market. And so we, we, we have to really, really lean into this and keep it to keep it consistent. We're perfected. It's never going to be, no, I'm not going to say it's ever going to be perfect, but we've got to work towards perfection. Uh, and that's what we've got a responsibility as a sales team, as a, as a sales company to do, because we are very important to the industry. Uh, if, if, if we fail, the industry fails. Well, Tony, your thoroughness is more than answered any question that I had. I, I just have to say, <laughs> you may be tired and exhausted, but I think we're jealous that you get to go to work every day at either one of the most beautiful horse farms in the world or one of the most beautiful racetracks in the world. That's got to be a, a, a real kick. Hey, I'm looking out of the paddock. My wind, the window of my office overlooks the paddock. Um, I pinch myself every day. I smile every day I come through the front gates. I think we all do. You know, we took an internal survey for employees as we're looking the how to you know, what's important, what's important to us all. And it's the, it's the whole, it's what we stand for. You know, the, the founders were very, very wise in putting the prospectus together in 1936 and it was to perpetuate the sport. And that is really what we're driven on a daily basis. And it goes down through everybody in the, in the, in the organization. So it's not something that everybody thinks, oh, Keeneland is this, and but no, we we stand for something. And that's what motivated me to come into a job like this or apply for a job like this. I feel very, very fortunate. No matter how difficult it is at times, it's we're as we're going through the books and we're working, but we've got the race meet to look forward to as well. You know, as soon as that is, we're, we're hosting the Breeders' Cup. As soon as that over, we're hosting the second largest sale in the world, the November sale, and bringing the world to us. And that in itself, as I said, I could, there's no greater pleasure to do that for, it's not self-serving by any means, even though I get a huge kick out of it. It's knowing that what we do as, as a group has repercussions throughout the industry. And that's, that's a huge responsibility, but it's also something that motivates us to do better every day. And uh, so hopefully we get to enjoy this sport and make it better, not trying to be overly, you know, sounding that we're, but, but it's, it's the motivation that makes us, uh, this drives us, drives us forward. So it's, it's, uh, I'm not giving up the seat. <laughs> <laughs> Nor should you, I mean, go get some rest. But thank you so much for the time, Tony. It's a magical place, and you Thanks, and your guys. team are doing everything you can to make it even better. Appreciate the time, Tony. Thank you, Look Tony. Look forward to seeing you down here over the next few weeks. Absolutely. Okay. The Green Group Guest of the Week is sponsored by The Green Group, an accounting, tax, consulting, and advisory firm specializing in the thoroughbred industry. This is week's Green Group Guest of the Week, Tony Lacey, will receive a free one-hour tax consultation. Learn more at greenco.com. We'll be right back after this message from The Green Group. Why do the most successful owners, breeders, and horsemen select the Green Group as their tax advisor? We simply save them money and know how to make them more successful. Over the past 40 years, founder Leonard Green has owned and bred some of the best racehorses in the history of the sport. His in-depth, hands-on industry knowledge, combined with cutting-edge tax-saving strategies, has produced positive results for his clientele and has made the Green Group the top-rated accounting and tax firm in the business. For a confidential and complimentary consultation, contact us at 732-634-5100 or visit our website at www.greenco.com. The Green Group, proven strategies to save you taxes.
this weekend. In the weekend preview, our focus shifts to Parks, to Ben Salem, Pennsylvania. Parks has the $1 million Pennsylvania Derby and the $1 million Cotillion for three-year-old males and three-year-old fillies, respectively. Very, very nice field in the Pennsylvania Derby. 11 horses, which you would expect for a million dollars, but it's not always what we get. I feel like we usually get seven or eight horses. You know, and other than Epicenter, I don't know who else you could ask for in this field. Uh, we've got Tabo, who's the slight favorite at five to two on the morning line. Uh, we've got Zandin breaking from the rail. It's a new rider in Joel Rosario. We've got Cyberknife, who's three to one, second choice, breaking the middle, close to the middle of the pack in, in the five hole. Uh, he's, you know, Epicenter, you would think, is is the slam dunk three-year-old champion right now. Cyberknife is the only other one that I think has a chance if he wins this race and then somehow wins the Classic. Obviously, it's probably not going to happen. But even like some of the lesser horses that you haven't really heard from in a while, Simplification was a nice horse early on the Derby Trail this year. White Abario is in there. Uh, B-Dog is an interesting little long shot for Doug O'Neill. Skippy Longstocking, We the People, Tawny Port. I mean, these are some nice horses. Like this, this isn't like the the B team of the three year old division. Uh, who you, you know, it's early, but who are you guys interested in in, in the Pennsylvania Derby? Uh, Joe, I mean, I think Tabor would be the horse you'd have to look at because, and again, I reserve the right to change my mind. I haven't done a deep dive into the race, but I think with him, I still don't think we've seen his best. I mean, he was rushed into the Kentucky Derby in his third lifetime start after winning the San Diego Derby. Uh, that didn't go well. Then came back off a layoff and, uh, you know, ran well in the Haskell. But I would expect that he would probably run a little bit better uh, in this race. And, you know, shout out to Parks here. And, you know, they've come up with a, like you said, a really good, really deep race. To think you have the Bluegrass winner, the Arkansas Derby winner, the Haskell winner, the San Anita Derby winner, and the Florida Derby winner. Not to mention, you know, horses that have won like the Fountain of Youth, West Virginia Derby, uh, and, and some other lesser races. But I'll give you one scenario to consider. If Cyberknife wins this race... And Epicenter doesn't win the Breeders' Cup Classic, which considering flight line, you know, looks like that very well could be the case. Um, uh, Epicenter would have one grade one win on the year and Cyberknife would have three. I'm trying to think, would that be, even though I know in my heart that Epicenter is the better horse of the two, that's kind of a, that's a big statement there. Three grade ones versus one. I think you could make a case uh, that, uh, that, that that Cyberknife could be the three-year-old champion. Now, if one of the other wins the Breeders' Cup Classic, all big ifs, that's going to settle everything out. But, you know, it's it's a really good race in, in here. Um, but I'm right now I'd be a Taba guy, you know, not giving you anything that any great insights in there. Uh, he is going to be the favorite in the race. Um, and, you know, back in the Bob Baffert barn, as we talked last week, you know, Baffert coming back from the suspension and, and everything is rolling, just great gun. For him. So um, he's won the race three times, Zito and uh, Nick Zito and Woody Stevens have also won it three. So he would add this as still another race where he has the most wins ever uh, in the career. But, you know, it's just without Epicenter, you don't have that big star in the race. But, you know, things we ask for competitive racing, big fields, a lot of good horses. It checks all the boxes, except maybe the star power one with Epicenter being, and I'm not saying these horses aren't good horses or stars or anything, but Epicenter being the, the, the main star in the division. Um, you know, it, it's going to be a fun race. They've done a great job positioning this on the calendar. You know, after the Triple Crown, you have the other three races, kind of a second, you know, go of the three race series, Haskell, Travers, uh, and, um, of course, the Pennsylvania Derby, Cyberknife running in all three. You know how I love it when guys actually run their horses. So good for you. Good on you, Brad Cox. We'll see what happens on Saturday. I'm really looking forward to this race. Yeah, six horses in this race were in the Kentucky Derby. Another one, Skippy Longstocking, was in the Preakness and the Belmont. And another one, We the People, was one of the favorites in the Belmont Stakes. So, I mean, you're talking about a really good Really good bunch here. And, Bill, I, I agree with your assessment that Taba is the horse to beat. I think the line maker got it right at 5-2. to two. Look, he was beaten ahead by Cyberknife in the Haskell, but he was the best horse that day. Right. Uh, he, had, he had an outside trip, whereas Cyberknife got through on the rail every step of the way, and still he was only beaten by a head. And if you recall that race, Taba, in the running of the Haskell, sort of took about an eighth of a mile off when they got to the half-mile pole and started dropping back. That's as right, he was yeah. Completely dead. And then, you know, sort of picked it up again and picked up the bit and, and charged back up again. So he ran kind of a spotty race and still almost won. With Zandon on the rail, I actually think Cyberknife is a good favorite to try to beat in your exotics or a good second choice in this case at three to one to try to beat. Uh, simply because two races back, 
when he won the Haskell, he got that inside trip I'm talking about. Last time in the Travers, when he was second to Epicenter, uh, he broke from post number one, and Florent Giroux wisely used his speed. He set an uncontested pace in relatively modest fractions for a race uh, like the Travers. And so he had an advantageous trip in both of his last two races. And now Zandon's going to save ground from the rail. Uh, so for me, I think Zandon and Tava, I think it's going to come down to one of those two. You know, just to the point about the three-year-old championship, you know, I think if it hadn't been such a resounding defeat in the Travers, you know, Epicenter was was so clearly best. I think Cyber, Cyberknife would have a little bit better of a case. But it is interesting, you know, maybe he goes in here and wins this race and then goes in the Breeders' Cup Dirt Mile and avoids flight line and wins that race. Then you got four grade ones. Now, we're obviously jumping ahead here, but if he had four grade ones and the Epicenter loses to flight line in the Classic – then I think you have an interesting you have an interesting scenario where there's more of a reasonable debate. But yeah, we're, we'll know more about Saturday after Saturday. But yeah, that, that's that was my my main takeaway from this race is that Cyberknife is the only one. He's the only one who has a chance to dethrone Epicenter right now. But it starts with winning on Saturday. It's going to be a terrific race. It'll be interesting to see how the pace shakes out. And the Cotillion's a pretty interesting race, which we're going to talk about after this break. From Three Chimneys, Gunrunner has had $5 million yearling sell so far at Kino in September, which is remarkable. He has a big weekend of racing coming up. You know, as we talked about, Taba and Cyberknife, both by Gunrunner. They're going head-to-head -head again in the Pennsylvania Derby. Plus, Steve Asprey's Trainee Society is in the Cotillion. And then Run, Run Son of a Gun is in the Grade 2 Gallant Bob Stakes. Also going to be some yearlings by Sharp Ass Tecca, who has 19 winners now. He, he has some yearlings at Kino in September this week on Tuesday. The very first horse to go through the ring was one of the top lots of the day. The colt was bred by Steve Cawthon's Dreamfields Farm, sold for $250,000. Sharp Azteca is the best value you can get right now with the start that he's gotten off to because that, you know, that stud fee is only going to go up and up if he continues his success. We'll be right back after this message from Three Chimneys. Here comes Tama. Tama in the center of the track with good looking stride. Squares off with Cyberknife. Cyberknife takes the lead. Tama going with him. These two in a thriller. Cyberknife just in front. And Cyberknife has won the TVG.com Haskell over Tama. Jack Christopher finished third. The running time, 1 minute 46.24 seconds. Come, dream with us at Three Chimneys. As I said, not only one, but two million dollar grade one races restricted grade one races this Saturday at Parks. We also have the grade one Cotillion Stakes. That's going to be run at 520. Pennsylvania Derby will run at 610 Eastern Time. Pretty nice field in the Cotillion as well. We've got nine horses, as I mentioned. Society for Steve Asmussen, the gun runner filly, won by six and three quarter lengths in the Charlestown Oaks last time out. The local hope, or at least local in terms of where she ran last time out, uh, Green Up, who's a very nice horse for Team Valor and Todd Pletcher, won the Catherine Sovia Stakes, which is the prep for the Cotillion at Parks, by three and three-quarter lengths. We also have Adair Manor, who was a top Kentucky Oaks contender earlier this year. She was second in the Black Eyed Susan when we saw her last. Uh, Goddess of Fire, who's been a nice little horse for Todd Pletcher. Gerrymander, who won the Grade 2 Mother Goose earlier this year. Shahama, who won the Monmouth Oaks last time out. So a pretty good field, but for me, the, the takeaway, or the, at least what I what I would, would have liked to see, is Moira. We've talked about Moira potentially running in this race after the Queen's Plate because she went off of the Triple Crown Trail in Canada. I thought this was the race they were pointing to. wonder where she's going to go next. Maybe you guys have a little bit of insight. But it's a nice field. But if Moira was in the race, to me, that would have been an appointment viewing. What do you guys think? Joe, as you mentioned that, I texted Kevin Attard today. Where are you going with Mora now that the cotillion is obviously out? It's either the E.P. Taylor or the Queen Elizabeth II. She's going to work this weekend. But he says, I want to wait to see the noms come out for the races. And I'm wondering if he's reading between the lines. I'm going wherever Charlie Appleby isn't going. <laughs> so it could be the case. But, yeah, she, she's terrific. I would have loved to have seen her in the, this race. You know, I grew up in Philadelphia, right, in, in Center City, Philadelphia. And this was my racetrack that I was raised on going with my dad. I go uh, go back to the days, not when it was just called Philadelphia Park. It was called Keystone. Randy will remember that, of course. It was right. Keystone Racetrack. So um, I have a little bit of a soft spot in my heart. From a gamp, another very good race, um, again, you're missing – only missing the number one horse. You're missing Nest. No surprise at all that she's not in there after running. Yeah, did I not even mention Secret Oath? My bad. <laughs> I, I, you did, well, I was going to get to that. I, Secret Oath, you know, is the logical uh, favorite in here in the headliner. 
there's something about her though. And I can't really put my, you know, my hands around it. I'm going to try to beat her. I mean, I know that she was got beaten by Nest, who was just tremendous, but she got drubbed in her last two races, um, by albeit by a very good horse. But I just think, you know, maybe she's not at the top of her game right now. If she had looked Nest in the eye and lost by a half a length in, in, in those races, you know, she'd be like three to five in here and say, well, she's, you know, uh, how can she lose this race? Um, Green Up to me is really interesting. Um, she's a horse that really stepped up last time out in the prep for this, the Catherine Sophia. Now she ran a, what is it, a hundred buyer number, Randy? I'm looking at my PPs here. Yeah. I guess the question would be, might she bounce off that? But I rather think that she's a horse that just took a while to get good for Todd Pletcher. Todd Pletcher, you know, obviously, you know, he can keep a horse going as well as anybody in the race. So again, um, you know, 96 hours out or whatever it is, she would be my pick, reserve the right to change my mind. But I think from a handicapping standpoint, you have to try to beat Secret Oath in there. Not that she's going to be three to five or anything. The race is too deep for that. I think she'll be more in the line of two to one, five to two, something like that. But uh, right now I'll put Green up on top. But again, very good, very deep race. It's giving the horse players and the racing fan what they want, a competitive race with a big field. Can't wait for the cotillion either. Yeah, the the resounding losses that Secret Oath had to Nest don't bother me that much in themselves because I think we saw in the Arkansas Derby, we saw in the Preakness, and we saw in those two races with Nest, that to me at least, Secret Oath doesn't look like the kind of filly that really relishes a dogfight. It's like when she's running against horses that she can beat, then she looks like a world beater. And when she's running against horses that she knows she can't beat, when it comes right down to it, uh, she might kind of check out a little bit. What bothers me the most about Secret Oath, and I can't believe I'm saying this because, you know, I mean, this kind of goes against everything I believe, but this is her 10th start so far this year. And in God, the context, poor horse. Call, call in Peter. Poor My horse, goodness. Poor horse. In the context of the way horses are trained in 2022, <laughs> uh, that's a lot of action for Secret Oath. And we just saw another uh, three year old in the Lucas Bar. And Wayne, he's not shy about running his horses, as we know. Uh, Ethereal Road, who really was being run a lot. And really began to show a downturn in his last couple on turf. So that is the primary reason I would be willing to take a shot against Secret Oath. And I think you zeroed in on exactly the right horse. And here's why. Adair Manor, you got the Bob Baffert factor, right? Adair Manor is the second favorite in the race at odds of seven to two, coming back off a second place finish in the Black Eyed Susan. The horse that beat her in the up and up in the Black Eyed Susan was a horse called Interstate Daydream. Interstate Daydream came after that, was shipped to Horseshoe, Indianapolis, and won the Indiana Oaks and won it impressively in another fast figure. And then she went to the Catherine Sophia, the prep race at Parks, and she was the one to two favorite against Green Up. And Green Up absolutely beat her fair and square. She's, she came around her, uh, the outside around the turn. She just darted away from her at the top of the stretch. Green Up has now won four races in a row by open lengths. Uh, she has that good buyer speed figure you pointed out last time of 100. Now, this is a filly that's very blue collar. She was only a $10,000 yearling by upstart out of a two punch mare. So she's, uh, you know, she's, she's not, she's not a lot in that department, but my gosh, on the racetrack right now for Todd Pletcher, she is really looking like a potential star in the division, not a nest star, but I think good enough to win the cotillion at six to one in the program. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I don't think you're going to get that. With that 100 buyer and then the Todd Pletcher factor, you know, Barry Irwin's probably going to put a big chunk of money on her, too. I, I, I suspect she's going to be more in the three to one, seven to two range. But you guys were talking about the, the full field, and they really have done a great job with this card at Parks, not only putting it in the right spot on the calendar, but you've got six stakes. The last six races on the card are all stakes races. Five of them are graded. You've got the Greenwood Cup has nine horses. The Turf Monster has 12. The Gallant Bob has 14. The Cotillion has nine. The Pennsylvania Derby has 11. And the Alphabet Soup Handicap is the last race of the day. It has another 10 horses. So, you know, we complain a lot about short fields on big days in racing. This is not one of those circumstances. Definitely the, the, the parks racing office and, and the, the people in Pennsylvania racing deserve your business this Saturday. It's going to be a great, great card. 
elsewhere on the calendar. Uh, not too much else going on. We got we have uh, the Athenia at the Belmont at the Big A, which is a Grade Three. A couple of stakes races at Churchill, including the Grade Three Dogwood. Uh, on Sunday, we've got the Gallant Bloom at, at Belmont, the Big A. And uh, shout out to Remington Park. They have the Oklahoma Derby and the Remington Park Oaks, which are both grade threes this Sunday night. But yeah, most eyes will be on parks, and it's a great, great betting sequence, so get involved for sure. The TDN Writers Room is brought to you by West Point Thoroughbreds. West Point has purchased over a dozen yearlings so far during the Keeneland September sale, including the current sale topper in the $2.5 million Quality Road Colt. They bought in partnership with Woodford Racing and Tala Racing. Look forward to watching a lot of these promising horses, hopefully next spring and summer. And this weekend, we have a big weekend of racing with B-Doc, who I mentioned before, coming off a win at Ellis Park in the Grade 1 Pennsylvania Derby. So best of luck to everybody at West Point. We'll be right back after this message from West Point Thoroughbreds. All the thrills. Fraction of the bills. Experience the power of the partnership. Change your life, make new friends, and compete at the highest level of thoroughbred racing. West Point Thoroughbreds, the gold standard in racing partnerships. Visit westpointtb.com. Being a small family business, I guess we're part of a dying breed. We're really grateful for the people that entrust us. We know it's a huge responsibility. We're always with your horse every step of the way when it comes to being at the sales ground showing your horses we are with your horse just driving up down the road every day there's not a time that i don't look out and feel a responsibility to the sport the animal the people that come to invest in the game i want to see as many people enjoy this sport as they possibly can because we do have the most beautiful sport in the world TDN Writers Room is brought to you by Legacy Bloodstock. If you think that 50 years combined experience in the horse business could benefit your program, give Tommy or Wendy a call. They personally advise on each horse as if they were their own. Legacy's had a great start to the Keeneland September sale. They had two yearlings sell for over $400,000 during the first two books, and a City of Light Colt sell for $500,000 during book three. So hats off to Tommy and Wendy and the team. They're selling their book five yearlings today, which is Wednesday, and then you can find them showing for book six out of Barn 39, so make sure, make sure you go check them out. They do a great job, and the results speak for themselves. This week's Remy cartoon is one that I think is really cute and funny. Uh, we got a couple of people sitting at a water station, and they're handing out water cups like they do in the marathon here in New York and Boston. And uh, it's, they say they're going two turns, which is why they're handing out the water cups. And I think, you know, the longer, the longer we go in racing, the less likely we're going to see that many two-turn races. So I think we're not that far off. With the, the tilt towards sprinters and milers, we might need a little bit of water breaks for some of these horses in the future going more than a mile. Okay, so that's going to do it for this week's edition of the TDN Writers Room, presented by Keeneland. Don't forget the Keeneland September sale is still going on through this, this Saturday, September 24th. Still plenty of good horses up for bids. And now all of the big wigs like John Green have gotten out of town. You can really get in on the ground floor in some of these cheaper horses and really make a, some big bucks next year on, on the racetrack. It's definitely top to bottom. It's a quality sale. And I think it's easier to find steals as we go on later in the, in the sale. It goes through this Saturday, September 24th. I want to thank Bill Finley, Randy Moss, our Green Group Guest of the Week, Tony Lacey, our producer, Patty Wolf. Our associate producer, Katie Petruniak, and our editors, Anthony LaRocca, Aliyah LaRocca, and Nathan Wilkinson, and also our fourth co-host, Lucy. Thanks for joining us this week. We'll see you next week. Lucy. Oh, wait, Lucy's gone? You got a call. <laughs> <laughs>